agenda today is just to go, is just to um, uh, give you an overview of NZ current re regulations. I'll talk about smart homes a quick bit at the moment and at the end, sorry, and future prospects, and just give you an overview of some of the projects we're involved in. So uh, something stops there. I'll have to click on. It. I'm not sure what happened oh, there, sorry. So just a quick overview, these are our current levels of CO2 emissions and we've got 18 of the warmest years have been in the last 20 years. So buildings are part of that solution and we need to mitigate and be able to manage kind of the, the warming climate and reduce our CO2 emissions. So basically how we all started with the, with the uh, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive was in 1997 the uh, Kyoto Agreement came through there and then we had the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. It was recast. It's actually being reviewed at the moment. I might throw a controversial one in there that I've been in discussion with some of the people that are looking at, at European level and then nearly in the future is probably going to become net zero over a, an annual balance of the of a year. So this is a, the um, uh, Irish uh, Climate Action Plan and the two of the, the big kind of uh, uh, pop outs for me and, and for us at the moment in buildings is 500,000 retrofits have to be done to a B2 BR. A lot of them are being improved. We're hearing better now at the moment than a B2 and install 680,000 heat pumps and is 400,000 into existing buildings. So big, big, big targets there, big, big, big kind of requirements for us in the future. So the construction and building environment account for 37 percent currently of Ireland's emissions, heat and cool and lighting, 23 percent and the embodied energy and the, the, the carbon emissions uh, due to the life cycle analysis we will talk about in, I think it's webinar eight, is 14 percent of our, our, our total emissions. So the near year energy buildings from the EPD, uh, Energy Performance Buildings Directive, is uh, high energy performance, low amount of energy required and covered significantly locally or close by or uh, nationally the, uh, renew by renewable sources. So they go, they were uh, updated in the 19, uh, in the 2000, sorry, 20, 2019 uh, Paratel Conservation of Fuel Directives and updated again in the 2021, not a huge amount in 2021, but it's still a good document to, to read. Um, it applies to new dwellings and it applies to existing dwellings with, which are where there's a major renovation, which is responsible for over a quarter of the building envelope surfaces. And there's ways of calculating that and looking at that in parallel, won't go into it in too depth. So to certify the building and, and see that you're in compliance, we use the, the, the dwelling assessment, energy assessment procedure, which is the DEEP, which is the BER assessor has to has to uh, model and comply with it. So it, that shows that an A1 is less than 25 kilowatt hours per, per square meter per year and a, a poorly operating house is 450 kilowatts per square meter per year. And that's quite a high level. And then if you look on the right hand side, it shows the watts per square meter requirement of a, of a house per year. Uh, we'll be sharing this at the end. So if I go a bit fast and you don't, you don't manage to take everything in, We'll be sharing these uh, presentations. So currently, it's seven. The, it's seventy percent of an improvement on a on a dwelling from two thousand and five. The EPC, the energy performance coefficient, and the carbon co co performance coefficients have improved by seventy percent and actually sixty five percent. The renewable energy ratio is twenty point two, which is twenty percent required. So how we, uh, as I already mentioned, how we um, uh, check that that's compliant with the re with the building regulations is through the deep. And there is a big thing that, that I I've noticed in modelling. If you use uh, uh, acceptable uh, construction details, your 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 side value for your building for your thermal for your thermal bridging goes down quite significantly and can bring up your gets a better performing building, but it can bring up your BR rating too. So this is a little nice little photo that we took when we were in Mount Lucas, which gives a kind of a bit of an overview. So it shows continuous insulation, airtight, very poor control, low thermal bridging, reduce your side values, high performance windows, uh, mechanical ventilation where required. That's if you're below three cubic meters per square meter per hour. 
uh, which we're finding a lot of buildings are getting that without even kind of uh, trying too hard to get it there actually to get because the because the construction kind of training of NZ is is, 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 is is proving and shown that it's better performing buildings and better delivered buildings high efficiency heating that's like looking at your heating system your ther ther your your thermal losses insulation in your heat and mechanical ventilation system and also renewable energy <coughs> excuse me so heat losses and gains as we as we as the picture on the right hand side is conduction convection and radiation which is different kind of flows i'll let you read that in the future so the heat losses are during the heating season there on the top and the heat gains which we're noticing nowadays is overheating is becoming is becoming a thing in buildings across uh, northern europe now where it wasn't really a thing before so there are the gains that can come in through your your buildings as well uh, so I do a quick quick intro to U values. On the left hand side is U value calculator. So how you calculate is you use all the different elements that make up your fabric. You 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 calculate them across the um, and they give you an R value and divide that by one and that gives you a U value. So I've just given a quick picture of a of a, of a U value calculator there that I use that's quite good and it gives a nice four page little outline of the of PDF of of your, your your building fabric of that particular U value. Um, so the U values can be found on part page forty seven of part L of a building regulation, TGD, and also all manufacturers' websites will give you the thermal conductivity, sorry, not U values, I mean thermal conductivity. That's the conductivity of the of the material that's the insulation. And there's a nice little quick calculation that somebody else gave me before. If you're ever doing a design stage or you want to figure out what the thickness of a particular material will give you quickly. It's only using the insulation, not the whole building makeup. So it'll give you a bit of an idea what your U value will be there on the left hand side. Uh, so if you divide your your thermal conductivity by the thickness of the material, uh, it will give you the U value. And then also, if you want to do the, the kind of revert that a little bit, find out how thick, what what kind of a thickness of material you'll need if you divide the thermal conductivity by the U value, it will give you the thickness that you, in and around the thickness you require. But you need to work out the whole. It's that that's just a kind of a quick overview, and then you have to work out the whole whole build the makeup of the of the whole uh, uh, fabric. So these are quite kind of nice little U value calculators that I use. The one on the top is BR, the BRE, the Building Research Establishment. The one in the on the right hand side is Ubicus, and the one on the bottom there is is a sheet from the PHPP. They're all uh, certified to the standard for thermal conductivity, and I've checked I check them all across the board, and they all work very well. So if you like the 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 internet one, which is Ubicus, the sheet or the or, or the tool, you can use whichever one you like there. So thermal bridging also is another big thing, in, as I mentioned, in, in the heat loss and heat gains. And they're where the, where the plane elements join. So your U values and your, your fabrics join up with each other. And that can be quite a crucial area. So as you can see here from the picture on the right hand side, where the thermal bridge and the, the insulation isn't being kind of, uh, kind of installed as correctly and as well as it could be there's a heat loss there and that could cause interstitial condensation, it could cause heat loss, it could cause mold and it could cause condensation on the internal walls, so it could cause issues. And also when we, we find in, in that like mold and can cause, uh, that can cause spores to be floating around in houses and that can, can, can affect people's health. So that's another thing that we, it's not just the building heat loss, it's the internal air quality and lots of other things that are up there, up there for it. And so here's the air tightness, quick uh, review of it. And also that's the heating year, the time of the heat year when it's cooler outside your air, your warm areas want to go to the colder area, but also if you revert that for the summer season, that's where the warm air can possibly come in and cause your house to overheat as well in certain instances. They're finding now, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit of the, it's called the heat island effect that in cities and towns, because the concrete and a lot of the, 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 the kind of fabric and the roads and all that are soaking up heat during the day, at night when people want to try and use their windows for cooling, that the radiation, the, 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 the heat is radiating back, radiating back off these elements and then causing the air to be a bit warmer and they're not actually managing all the time to be able to cool their buildings. 
So there's a thing about that and air tightness and maybe cooling requirements in the future, especially in the in, in the urban areas. So I'll just go through the U values are here for new build in Ireland. I might be controversial here, but I would not use uh, a 1.4 of a window if I'm putting in a new window. I would use there's there's windows out there with a standard of 0.85 to 0.7, so and they're about eight to ten percent more expensive than windows of that new value. And door you can get doors nowadays that it, again if they're new to a U value of up to one, they're composite doors and all that, and they're all certified and that kind of thing. So for for um, retrofitting, these are the U values, and this is if 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 it clicks on that 25% of the surface requirement. Um, but I also, I'm going to go into that in another, so I won't mention it yet. I'd also, if I'm replacing my windows, not up doing them up, I would be going for a better U value than that. That's my personal opinion, because the overall energy balance of the year means it stops the it stops the heat loss over the winter, but also the the good U value and the good G value, the solar gain value on the on the glass stops overheating as well. In certain times of year, east the air is not too hot in the morning, so you, it, but south of during the day and west during the evening when the air is warmer, the radiation to get into your house is easier. So again, I, I'm open to any suggestions that might disagree with me on that, but. I would I would go for a, a, as high U or a low U value for your windows as possible if you're replacing them. So in in our architecture, historical and heritage buildings, we have to look at the whole picture. We can't just go in there and kind of, as I joke about, put plastic windows into the Kilkenny Castle or retrofit Dunangus with external insulation. We have to look at the picture and the heritage and the culture of things and do what we can. And there's lots of kind of materials out there that work really, really well with kind of uh, older buildings. They're breathable. They've got low, um, more kind of heat attenuation. They're able to soak up heat and give it away. And the, the uh, code of practice there is a very good document to have a read over as well the uh, SR54, just to have a look at, because there's a lot of good good information in there. There's a lot of reading to be done when you want to get into a lot of this stuff, and I suppose I don't have a TV, so I've done a lot of it over the years. So the grants available at the moment for major retrofit for build, for house, for dwellings are, there's a one-stop shop, which looks at the whole picture and, want, uh, and wants to do the whole thing, the whole retrofit in one go, and then there's individual grants. And I suppose this, this triangle or inverted triangle gives us the um, the climate impact, but the, all these measures are actually worth doing as well, including the energy storage. I have batteries at home now. My solar PV is is chair, is is producing more electricity than I have. Uh, a load on in the house is only four hundred watts at the moment, but we're producing about five kilowatts, so my battery is charging. And you know, there's a thing, there's a, there's these uh, options for renewables where you can heat your water and maybe even turn on your heat pump in the future. This is the, be the smart buildings. So another thing we're looking at with the Tipperary Energy Agency Super Homes and the IGBC is to have a building passport. So if you're not able to, if you don't have the facility at the moment to retrofit your building, everything in your building today or this week or this year, that you have an overview, an assessment and a passport that shows you all uh, that has all the measures possible in the future and that means that you might not do something today insulation or wind or air type that that you might have to go and change in the future so it gives an overview and a, and, and a potential for your building and we're looking at maybe having it because a logbook for a car is about an inch and a half thick is that metric inch and a half, 40 millimeters 48 millimeters but sometimes when you get a house handed over to you, you get a key and, and a piece, one sheet of paper. Whereas we always believe that you, we, we used to give when we were installing renewables and kind of, we were doing some kind of sustainable buildings at the time, we'd always give the homeowner a day with the, probably the plumber, the installer, even the electrician and, and, and someone that we'd all go through and show them how the building worked and how all the heating system, because when we've got smart buildings, we, the people that, are living in the, the the occupants need to know how these buildings work and how to kind of adjust bit, different bits and pieces for heating because I always believe that it takes at least a year or two heating seasons to figure out how your heating system is working because you know certain um, things work differently in different in different um, kind of circumstances. So I used Stevie came up with this cool car analogy and a car analogy for 
buildings is a good one. So basically, uh, the Golf is a B2, the, the, the Formula One car is an A1, and the lorry is a G. And it basically means lower the, lower the load, higher, uh, make your, uh, your, your engine size and be your heating system more efficient, and higher, the, the faster you get to heating or cooling or whatever you need, the better. So that's a kind of a nice analogy that Stevie came up with. Thumbs up there. So we modeled the BER then for um, just to check on today's energy prices. And we looked at oil, natural gas, air source, ground source, wood pellet, and wood chip. And we saw that this is the cost per year that we have. So you can see when we get more into the more sustainable and kind of energy efficient kind of heating systems, the cost is less. I just show you there on the wood pellet. I have a wood pellet stove that heats my underfoot, that does my space heating as well. I, it's cost me 1200 euro. I love data in the last four heating seasons. So it's basically cost me 300 quid a year to, to heat my house at the moment. And our heating system is it's not quite to passive standard. I failed a bit on the air tightness test, but we've had our heating off since March and we won't probably won't in the last three years we haven't turned it on before at the end of kind of towards the end of October. So I modeled and uh, I just did a quick thing in the BER deep there just to show you what, what how you can get even from an A3, which is energy is look it is 58 kilowatts per square meter per year. That was a quite high efficiency and good planes and a low heat loss indicator. And I threw on five kilowatts of of PV as into the renewable tab, it, which create which which generates 475, and that then turned the house into an A1 minus energy. So it's actually negative energy use and negative CO2 emissions. Just show you there as a kind of that, that renewables are a good option in certain circumstances. So I suppose smart homes with the future will be where everything talks to each other. Your solar system will talk to the house and if the if it could heat the water or charge your car if that's what's required or charge your battery that you might have in stage in the future if you've got too much solar even in the winter it might turn your heat pump on it could go to sell to the grid if somebody down the road needs some you can donate to the grid we're doing a pilot scheme with the IERC and Glasgow Energy at the moment to where I could virtually donate electricity because I think my thing is going to, I spilled 1.7 megawatts, 1700 kilowatts to the grid in the last um, about 150 days, but for 200 quid, 300 quid extra a year, I'm not overly pushed on that, probably spend more than, co than that on coffee. So I wouldn't mind donating a few poor houses virtually in other parts of the country. So if you can instruct the utility to take it off, it can be done in the future. We're not there yet. And obviously the rainwater harvesting is another very big thing that we, we, we installed in a lot of houses in the past because we're looking at the loads. The reservoir levels are getting down and we're using, I've, I've been involved with Trinity College guys with a, um, a couple of hydro projects and we looked at rainwater harvesting and stuff like that as well. And we only need about one, two percent of our water needs to be possible drinking quality. So the other nut said we'll just call it 90% can be can be on, can be our rainwater and it just you know it can do the flush the toilet we can we can wash it we can wash our clothes we can even use it in the dishwashers and all that and you can actually get a, a filter and an upgrade system where the rainwater can be is certified to a possible um, quality we in some of the feedback we got from houses that we did install it was that the, you use less detergent because the water is softer so you use less water, washing up liquid at the sink you're also using less uh, detergent for washing your clothes and, and some of the feedback we've got with that, that it's nicer on the skin because the water is less hard and it's nicer on the hair so the feed, the feedback was very beneficial from the, the rainwater harvest and I, I, I want to I, I think in the future that would become a it is coming more into the deep uh, assessment and I think it would be more in the future because the guys from Trinity kind of made it made a very nice point once why are we flushing food down the toilet because it's a food grade substance possible water stop talking about that now so the other thing then is modern methods for construction i'm in touch with pj rodden on on certain things there and you know where we where, where off-site construction is more efficient it's faster it, 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 
it, it certifies the a lot of the a lot of the different parts of the fabric and it can speed up and deliver faster better houses and it's got a lower embodied carbon lower waste and lower thing we also have the on the left hand side here is a project called bimsy we're doing which is bim and ends they've all mixed up together if anybody's interested you take that you can go and log into that site we've got 12 learning units there that are um very very informative that we worked on a couple of are a good few european partners on it and all the information is free the website's open for the next two years all the information is free on their powerpoints pdfs everything you can you, it's all it's all free to free to free to load so just a quick overview now i think i'm what am I, i'm 23 minutes in over time so overview of some of our other project our green public procurement one is where we we're, we're creating training, Stephanie's creating training for uh, an online training clause course, which we're going to be delivering in September. Anybody that it's aimed at um, kind of local authority. So anybody there today that's interested in that, excuse me, work for a local authority, give us a shout and we'll, we'll put you in touch with the, with the project leads. So being, this one is Buzzgo Circular, is one where we're looking at blended measures to get energy demand and training for NZ across the across the whole sector. This build up skills app also is a thing that we're working on. We work with the SEI, IGBC, and when it was two before I came along. And it's a place where you'll be able to go in the future, look for training for your particular um, role. So if you're a carpenter, if you're a um, a professional a kind of a, um, a, a building, a beaker, a certifier, an architect or whatever, and it'll give you trainings from NZ kind of at the ETVs, which I'll be talking to in, about in a minute, and also the um, into degrees uh, and masters and PhDs. And so it gives you the whole overview from, you know, maybe a day's training to five years training. We we're looking at possibly in the future that we could, we, I could certify that I've done and and to, you know show that I've done these courses. And if somebody was looking for somebody that is is it has these skills, they can go on to this app in the future and find someone if they've shared that they're shared their GDPR and their information and go and find a person if they're looking maybe for employment or whatever. So we we're, we're kind of jiggling with that with 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 um um with Jan in in Holland at the moment who's our lead on the build up skills app so next then is the training for the NZ courses which at the moment there's three in the country uh, WWETB Mount Lucas and Limerick two of the two of the experts are on this call at the moment Barry and Bev my stuff lads they've taught me lots of stuff in the future. This is a, the NZ training courses that you can do at the ETBs at the moment, and there's the way to find it. That picture on the right is, is, a, is a display kind of rig in Waterford that has an airtight room here. And outside, it's got the different building, the different build, envelope buildups around the other side. It's got some other um, external insulation, wood-based, EPS, poly-ISO. It's got internally, then it's got the air tightness. It's got some defects. And this yoke here is an air tightness fan. So when Barry turns that on, you can see all the defects. You can open the windows. You can see where the air is coming. You can see defects that cut hole in the air tightness tape and show what, what how to assess where where uh, mistakes may have been made and also repair them very easily because if you can find an airtightness uh, leak before the bit of, before the building fabric has been all closed up it's very easy to repair and then they have these uh, uh, pendulum uh, re fans that are kind of uh, they do they, they work at two of them work together as in if you if you have a retrofit and you can't um, Put all the piping in for it, but your air tightness requires mechanical ventilation. And if, you, if it's very difficult to put all the piping and duct work, and these yokes work, and one takes out the air, it goes through a ceramic core that takes the heat, re recovers the heat, and the other one takes in the air, and then the, they work backwards. So they work really, really well together, and there will be people talking. Sorry, ventilation in the future. And then we have our DASB Digital Academy for the Sustainable Built Environment. And these courses are what we're, what we're, we're developing now at the moment. And we're teaching them. There's new ones coming on, on online. I think I'm supposed to be helping out with a bit of teaching in the future. So if you want to contact anyone to get some more information about that, Liz O'Brien is the DASB manager. 
and then we have the uh, the both go circular, which uh, another friend Martin is is in charge is lead on in Ireland, and it's basically about multifunctional green roofs and how they work together. So we're increasing dark de market demand for circularity skills, so everything stays in the circular economy. I think that's number eight. Develop training courses, bringing more women and youth into the circular economy, because at the moment, it, it, sorry, into the construction profession and add to the circular skill because at the moment 12 to 16 percent is is women in the construction center we need to increase that because they find more gender balance in projects and on sites and even in design stage but it, it, people work together and the delivery and the the outcomes are better so that picture at the top is me young fella doing the virtual reality training with Barry at WWETB and we're bringing down another load of transition year students as part of this project to next Monday to do uh, virtual reality training so it's virtual reality and retrofit and so you get to go put in a window insulate it around it do air tightness do insulate an attic and all these types of things so it gives people an overview and an introduction and then you can go and look at the actual rig, like the picture I showed you there. And there below there is a, a sustainable kind of, a, it's kind of a green product. It's wood-based and sand-based insulation with lime-based cork insulating plaster on the back and lime-based plaster on the front. So it's a breathable. So that would be working very well in a traditional and a kind of a, a culturally kind of older type of building. Thanks for listening. Tomorrow, April will probably be a bit kind of uh, faster than me and get a bit more overview. And if you need to talk to me, there's my email there. I'm going to hand you back to Stevie now because he's going to take care of the uh, of the questions. And I'll stop sharing. Thanks a million. Sorry, that was supposed to be 15 minutes. There's no bother, <laughs> Albany. Um, and just unfortunately, we, we don't have any more time. Uh, we only have about a minute left on so we're going to have to cut it short, but um, there's been three questions that have come up and um, we'll make sure that we'll get, um, we'll email back the answers, probably that'd be the best thing to do. So uh, as Benny said, that tomorrow there'll be um, another um, webinar 